we'll hold our heads up high and beat the drum to what we love. Risk the fall, or we have felt it all come crashing down from far above. Stars are rising, countless worlds colliding, only one will take it all. Can we bring to fall the giants? Can we make the final call?
and gentlemen, welcome back to Fractal's very first League of Legends tournament, Day 2. Day 1 was a banger. I, I'm Dia, joined by Tenrak, of course. And Tenrak, uh, I have introduced you specifically for the purposes of breaking down the wildness that we saw yesterday and what we might expect to see today. Well, we saw two incredible teams duke it out, take it all the way to three games last night, Team Try and Team Penta, but only one made it out. Team Try is heading to the finals. Which other team tonight between Team Quad and Team Hexa will make it out to duke it out for the stunning prize pool, including 20 soul, a metric butt ton of Riot merch, and probably most importantly, a super special Discord role that only Dia and I have at the moment. What can I know you give us? Power, maybe? But what could it give you? I don't know. You can figure that out. Glory. every Everything you could ever need. Most importantly, the honor of being our very first League of Legends champions. And Hex and Quad do need to take that step up today. It is their time to flaunt their stuff for the rest of the, for the, rest of the audience. Because, uh, let's be honest, Hexa and Quad right now have a lot to live up to. Try looked really good yesterday, had great early game plans, and Hex and Quad, as of yet, are unproven quantities. But I'm sure they've got support in the audience. So hit us up in Twitch chat with who you think is going to be our victor today. But who do you think it'll be, Tenrec? It's definitely a tough call. Both of these teams, they clearly have some prowess and some practice under their wings, which we couldn't say as much for the two teams that got to play yesterday. Both teams have had some more time and uh, both teams, they definitely have some followings behind them. We've always seen the hype in both Twitch chat. We've seen it in the Discord as well. We've seen it in between the team's chats themselves. Everyone's really been paying attention to both of these games. But I think when it comes down to it, I think that Hexa has had a couple less stumbles along the way. They've looked really clean. They have some really high ELO players. And I, I, I think that they have a bit more of a handle on the flow of how this match may end up. From I mean, what that little I could see. I, I mean, absolutely. I think that it would it would be odd were I to disagree with you, mainly because Quad has, have gone through even roster changes in the days leading up to this. They're separated by literal time zones in between them, potentially a lot of lag problems. And with Hexa being so well-practiced, having created their own Discord server in order to practice, I'm excited to see what sorts of strats they bring to the table. And I'm excited for what I can only assume are our underdogs in Quad, because if they are able to pull out game one, they're going to surprise everyone in most important importantly team hexa oh absolutely no quad i mean that's one of the most fun stories you can bring to the table for a game of league the panic mode team cup where everyone kind of just has a, the the right amount of trust to be able to, to to bring whatever they need to the table and we're gonna bring a couple champions out of contention from the table firstly caitlin and silas Draft appearing above us and both very, very good bands. I was looking at actually the statistics on Caitlyn bands earlier today. And in, in a lot of major regions, she has been banned almost 30% of the time. And that's on the lower end of things. Just this season alone, extremely lane dominant. And it's no surprise to see the Zeri end up alongside it. Another very strong AD carry. We got a chance to see this yesterday. And if your ADC is comfortable on those hyper mobile champions on hitting their skill shots, there's no better AD carry to to pick up it is a lot of focus though from team hexa into the bot lane of team quad and that's for a very good reason the ad carry of team quad makel has been playing out of his mind recently and may very well be the carry that team quad need hexa they're very aware of of what quad is going to be able to fall back on and they're prepping for it and like you said we saw ac dominate with the zeri in the bot lane last game hexa definitely doesn't want to let any kind of domination like that befall them still a lot of definite bot picks jinx is still in the running of course but hexa might get first dibs on that aphelios is also down there too so still a diverse pool that i'm sure quad will have no trouble picking from I like that you mentioned the Aphelios here because there we go. Last ban looks like it's going to be locked and we'll see what it was as there is a small error in the pro draft. However, I like the idea of the Lee Sin. You could have removed something like the Zin Zhao as well, giving yourself an extra power pick, but now you've got the option to pick up two of them, both Zin and Aphelios available. And it's no surprise to see this Aphelios hovered, likely going to see it locked in as he is the one true answer to Jinx in the late game. If you want any hope of being able to contest in the team fights you've got to have an aphelios you've got to have a hyperscaling AD carry 
Yeah, Jinx is probably the most confident blind pick you can have in the game right now, as long as Zeri isn't oh. banned. But beyond that, Aphelios is probably the best possible, most confident counter pick and bot you can have to Jinx at the moment. Able to deal with so much of the utility that Jinx brings to the table, especially in that early game, so Jinx can't find that easy ramp. Like I said, they could have taken Xin Zhao out of contention as well. Instead, they got Lee Sin, and so Quad is going to grab that while Hexa picks up the Thresh. Interesting. I like the Thresh consideration here, and while it is a very high skill cap support, it provides some much-needed mobility to Jinx and denies the Aphelios Thresh combo that has been plaguing Solo Q, that has been plaguing professional play because of just, of course, the hyper-carry ability of Aphelios. That extra mobility does a lot this time. Again, the denial plus the extra utility added onto Jinx. It does leave Team Quad with the difficult decision as to whether they want to pick an Enchanter for Aphelios in this late game or whether they want to pick a Nautilus or a Leona to try and contest in the early game to be able to actually play the lane out. Already going to be a lot of contention for chemistry in the bot lane. Jinx and Thresh, they work well together when they work well together. Those couple seconds that Thresh has with the play can be crucial to get a lot of damage with something like a Super Mega Death Rocket, but the right communication has to be there. I think Hexa may be able to do it, but the question is, how consistently? Quad, meanwhile, they're on their third pick. I think they've been mousing over a couple candidates, but they haven't settled on one just yet. Looks like it might be the victory, and yes, that is what they'll end up settling on. A very flexible team composition, at least initially, from Team Quad. When you've got the Aphelios, you've got the Sin Zhao, you can go either heavily into Dive or into this more front-to-back composition. And with the Victor, we've decided that it's going to be front-to-back. Team Quad's win condition is no longer getting on top of the Jinx, but providing way more damage than Hexa can with the combination of the Aphelios and the Victor. I want to see them double-triple down on that by picking a tank in the top side, because otherwise, the front line of Hexa is terrifying. When you've got something like that, Shen, that can reliably not only save your AD carry, but take up so much time in the front, line with the safeguard you've definitely got a problem to chew through and quad needs something that is equal or greater to that perhaps something like a scion perhaps an orn that we haven't seen in a long time we haven't seen any top bands so far for that matter and tom kench will be the first relative decision to that front but i absolutely agree quad they need to get themselves up on a pedestal before hexa launches something out to take that pedestal out from under them quad mm -hmm. they need to find that last step to make sure all that damage that can come out from Victor and Aphelios from mid to late game can all be worth it. Or, I mean, again, if Jinx finds those springboards and is able to carry out a lot of damage as we hit that midpoint, then Quad, they're going to be up a creek without a paddle as time goes on. Get rid of two junglers before Hex is back to the ban phase. Quad, they're, they're trying to lock out what options may be left for Hexa. Worth mentioning, while we're, while we're waiting for what this top lane matchup will end up being, is we have assumed so far that Shen will be going top, that things like the Gwen have not been touched yet. And that is a very scary thing to bring up the top side. Yes, it's not a tank, but it can be very pseudo-tanky in the same way as Xin Zhao with the Hallowed Mist. So we'll see if that ends up getting picked up. I think a nice denial of the Malphite, a great sort of mitigation of possible engage and threat onto Jinx, continues to double down for Team Hexa. They need Jinx. Jinx to stay alive so that everyone else will die, but Quad still have that big decision to make as to what they'll end up picking, whether they go down the more damage-heavy route with something like the Gwen, or whether they try and itemize into that front-to-back right now by picking themselves up a tank, and I like this hover. I do like that hover and that pick. Gragas is a great addition to the squadron. The ability to roam from jungle to top gets rid of that contentious ban onto Malphite. Hexa, they want to make sure they control both of the side lanes so the damage can ram more easily, as well as that bulk that could run with Jinx on the sidelines as they approach towards team fights. With Malphite, it's harder to go that direction because you cannot kill Malphite as often as you can kill a lot of other top laners. That's I feel like that that's a pretty general amount of knowledge that we know at this point. But I think Gragas is a great sort of substitution for that, able to take up the jungle with a lot of presence and then able to roam up top to contend against this probable Shen, uh, no matter what they end up facing. You know, I, I think we got to see uh, an enchanter here as well. We've got a jungler. We've got what we can theorize to be a top laner in this Gragas. And oh, my Lord, with the Viego and LeBlanc lock in, there's a lot of threat onto the back line. You need to be able to keep Aphelios alive and you need to make sure he's pumping out more damage than the Jinx. I'd like to see something like a Lulu, like a Seraphine 
picked up here just to give this Aphelios a little bit more survivability. Because remember, that Tom Kench, no longer a problem. We did talk about this choice, though. Enchanters mean that you get to play the late game, and it looks like uh, tanking, tank supports mean that you get to play the early game. You get to actually lane against Jinx Thresh. And I can't fault them for it, but it is going to make things a lot riskier for Makel in the late game. Hex try and be the party starters all throughout this game. They're going to try and initiate with a Flay or some Harrowed Mist or, or even an ultimate uh, from the Jinx or the Shen. Um, but I feel like Anatolis might be able to mitigate that at least from the beginning to at least slow mm -hmm. things down. But that raises the question, can they mitigate that for long enough to have enough control to stop that late game ramp that Hexa is going to try and lean on so dearly? I mean... We can only find out when we jump into the game, which it looks like these teams are about to do. I like both of these comps, but they have to be played to a T if they work out correctly. I do as well. And I mean, especially Team Hexa, right? We're looking at them and they have a composition that is all about keeping Jinx alive. And well, Viego and LeBlanc serve the important purpose of at least putting threat down onto Aphelios. There's a lot that Team Quad have, not just in the form of being able to Again, backline with the victor is this sort of alternate win condition, but additionally, in their ability to start fights. Nautilus, Gragas are really good at going, I want to fight now, and we are going to fight now. Team Hexa don't have a lot of those go buttons. A Lucky Threshook would be nice. A Shen Taunt is unlikely. Team Quad should be able to pick only the fights that are best for them, and that's the sort of control, that's the sort of discipline that I am expecting, nay, demanding from Team Quad as we load into this, to see their practice come to fruition, to see them take down the favorites in game one. This is the comp they need to do it. They're going to need to stay disciplined, and they're also going to need to stay ready, because, yeah, they'll be able to start fights, but can they actually fight when they mm. start them? That's going to be the biggest question, I think, for me, as, as the as the game sort of proceeds on, as, as we get through those wave clears, as they try and play catch up with that CS, will they be able to actually fight something for long enough for them to gain control, gain those crucial bits of territory, gain those kills as we head into those river contention spots? I mean, we're likely going to see it really early where most teams would fight around first or sorry, would rather fight around third or fourth dragon. This is likely going to be a combat over the first two dragons because looking at the way that the lanes line up, top lane should kind of be a snooze fest. These two guys should be much more about being able to join the rest of their team and have impact later. But when we look at the mid lane and the bot lane, there's countering push rune scimitar for team quad in the mid lane should have push with the victor but in the bot lane jinx rockets do so much for laurel and this should mean that both teams have the same priority when it comes to this dragon from two different angles they should meet around those first two dragons they should scrap and at least when i'm looking at the zins out it may just favor team quad but to figure that out we are going to have to wait until we get onto the rift. So we are going to take this to a very short break as we wait for the spectator delay to tick down. However, Tenrek, it's time for me to remind you that this event is, of course, uh, uh, bringing you casters from Beyond Ranked, a platform where you can book commentators for anything, whether it's a tournament, a league, or even a show match between friends. You can find commentators to hype up your gameplay. You can use Beyond Ranked to manage your entire broadcast by finding new talent, adding them to your team, and assigning them to specific broadcasts. No longer do you have to use spreadsheets and doodle pools. You can use Beyond Ranked. You can check out beyondranked.com or hop in their Discord today. And with that, we'll be right back.
Welcome to the Rift, ladies and gentlemen. The very first game of Team Hexa versus Team Quad kicks off right here, right now. And it's worth mentioning, as we get into this, that Team Quad have actually chosen to uh, rename themselves. They, they want to continue flying the Quad flag, make no mistake, but they will be doing so under the very hip and cool title of the Island Boys. No, they're, they're, they're super with the times. They're, they're right up there in the moment. I love it. It's great. I can't wait to call them that. For this whole match, I'm gonna remember gonna every it? single. I'm gonna remember every single time. I, I'm not going to I sing it. You know, you know the song, right? I'm never gonna sing that. I want. I I want to say yes, but I also want to say no so bad. I'll. He, 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 it's, it's okay. I'll sing it for you. Please don't. Please, <laughs> I'm please, an please island don't. boy. Please. <laughs> I'm gonna do it the rest of the time too. I'll I'll split it up so you, you know it's, it's, it's gonna it's gonna be slow. Every time that they get a, you know, the first couple kills they get. Is, it's a, no, you, it's great. We'll, you with we'll, a little island we'll, boy. We'll get to make so many puns about islands after, you know, what we end up seeing from Quad. You know, if, if somebody, you know, goes out on their own and, like, lurks, that we, that could be an island. Oh, could, yeah. Like, like Coplin. Yeah, like, somebody could be, like, deserted over in, like, bot, like, support could roam for too long and ADC could be left around. That's, a, that's like an island. Then you're an island There's, boy. Like, deserted, that's, that's like a deserted island. Island, yeah. island boy. I like it. I like it. We'll, we'll, we'll see it. if we we'll see if we can find our own little islands we'll as the game there. goes on. Let's let's go ahead and check in, by the way, with our with our junglers, because we've got some pretty creative pathing going on already from Griffith. You'll notice he started up at the top side on his red buff and has gone from wolves into Gromp right now. A really early timing, and that ward that Laurel put down for Team Hexa is going to get a lot of value if Zinzo tries to go bot lane. Oh, yeah. Everybody's going to be able to know where he's roaming for the time being, but of course will expire soon enough. And QLDP can exhume that sort of presence long enough for the Rome to, to still have some impact, regardless of how much visibility there is, especially if Psionics can't contest when it comes to their clashing pathing at the river, which might happen soon, depending on how they rotate. And they've been rotating a, in a little bit of an unorthodoxical fashion. Okay. Over. Zinzao actually gets spotted right here going for the scuttle, but he's going to walk right into Psionix. Zinzao should win this early, but Sohu does have first roam. Knockup available for Griffith. Flashes the initial lockup from Su Sohu. Suhu? Suhu? Sohu? Which Suhu. way do we want to go? Suhu! Suhu. Suhu. Like, a, like, a, like a Mario. <laughs> Suhu! <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. We'll, we'll, we'll see if we can get a little more action from him. That was very exciting from these guys. However, Zinzao pathing towards bot again does get spotted, oh. but it doesn't look like it matters. Han ends up going down to a very nice, controlled, simple play from QLDP. This, short, this sort of swarming has worked out so far, and, and it started when Rune was able to contest against Suhu when, once they were trying to approach onto Griffith back in River. They recognized, oh, a lot of this team is probably not going to be that ready for us if we pack ourselves in all of a sudden. They did that again on bot lane, and they got some connection out of it to start things out. Great beginning there. Very good flash and dodge from Scimitar. Gets him out of a gank in mid lane. However, flashless Victor going to be significantly more vulnerable later. The nice thing is, I wouldn't be worrying too much if your team quad, because think about what they just got done in the bot lane. Not only did they get a kill, but they did not a significant amount of farm from Laurel as well. So Felios starting to look pretty good even this early on into the game. Victor can kind of take a step back. He can say, it's my job not to die. As long as I collect farm, I'm good. Bree, however, maybe not so lucky. Yeah, Quad, they provided the space to be able to play a little more passively for the most part. I'd say Bree is that sort of one weak spot in there. Because again, top has been pretty isolated right now. Psionix is having that consistent roam though. So keeping that sort of fear factor up there so Bree can't get as much space as the rest of the island boys have developed for themselves. But beyond that, mid, bot, and jungle for Griffith, everything is, is cleared out enough, hypothetically, for them to play exactly how they want to play for the foreseeable oh. future. This is this is killer though. Type oh, V has boy. had one heck of a freeze, and Breeze already expended the teleport, and now the belly bump trying to fight him. There's a chance for Psionic to try and gank this, and as Breeze steps up one more time, Type V is low. Psionics may be able to get a little bit of a chunk. Doesn't look like it's going to turn into too much, however, as belly bump back forward. Does look for this victor. Having revealed himself top though, Psionic is going to lose this first dragon. And some very nice moves from Quad take advantage of it. Yeah, I'm glad that Bree could move in and stall long enough for 
Thionics not to be able to have a presence down there to even contest against Griffith. They played that super well. And with the initial dragon for themselves, I mean, Cloud Drake isn't a lot, but what it is is one step towards what is likely going to be a very powerful soul. I think unanimously Cloud Soul likely the least sought after, but uh, you get the guarantee at this point there's not going to be either a cloud soul or a mountain soul pushing us a little further into the very oppressive ones like ocean and like hextech so if quad can continue stacking these drakes it's going to be really good for them however up in the top side Bree, who has now been equalized with after the reset from type v still continuing to push still continuing to be overextended with very little vision and weirdly enough, still continuing not to be punished. And Bree has a lot of freedom with the backup at this point. Despite the fact that they're a little behind in CS, they can work with that. They have a lot of damage in at this point, and they have a lot of space to roam around. Meet up Griffith down in River here, take care of Scuttle, and get some control over the Herald once it spawns in a minute 15 here. Type V can't get that much space here. At least they can do a little more clearing, which is good for the later portion of, of this level 6 ramp that we're seeing from either side. But Four. Bree is perfectly happy with just with just waiting, honestly. Mako's got to clear out this wave. Hook does land on him underneath the tower. Ignite's gone down. Suhu is here, but Mako is able to kite this out, getting one kill in return with QLDP still in bot lane, still very much alive. And Suhu forced to flash out. This one for one is not what Hexa thought they were getting. I mean, it's enough for Quad at this point. Going to drag Suhu along with QLDP, but I don't know if they have enough space to be able to drag them over to the turret. They just barely do. They They're don't. able to get Psionics in. There's going to be a boatload of damage. And QLDP can take care of Psionics before backing back out. Okay, this support's kind of nuts, actually. QLDP, not once, but twice now, has picked up kills for himself. This Nautilus is two and oh, maybe he's the carry that we're looking for. I just got, I just got news. I just got news. What was it? We've been pronouncing the Shen's name wrong all along. Apparently it's type five instead of type V. What have we done? Is he Roman? What do we do to deserve this? Are people Roman anymore? Or are they just Italian? I I don't think Type 5 is Roman. I think Griffith and uh, I think Griffith especially is, is roaming right now. All right, well, Type 5. like you never left. Exactly. And now, well, with oh, Bree so flashing low. away. I don't, I, I didn't think he was going to survive that, I'll be honest, yeah. but Gragas is a pretty good champion. Very tanky, lots of survivability. Suhu, not so much, however. Griffith could have thought about engaging on that, chunking out the LeBlanc a little bit, but did play that respectfully, given there's a lot of vision set up in the area for Hexa and with the Rift Herald already started. I don't think Griffith is too concerned about it. You'd rather pay attention to this bot lane that is snowballing the heck out of here. Han already forced to flash down there. Scimitar is holding it down in mid lane. You keep funneling resources into this Aphelios. It's going to pay off. This guy's got red, white right now, and they are fighting in the bot lane. Moonlight Vigil connects. One kill gets picked up by Mako. He's likely going to get a second, but as Laurel gets excited, he is just barely out of range of the auto attack. What he's not out of range of, however, is unfortunately Griffith, who is coming for him. Oh yeah, Griffith's on the way, recognizing that a lot of the power is in ADC, but Psionix recognizes that as well as on the way back. Makel can see that with the ward, though, and is on a very, very far retreat. Might end up regretting that, especially if Griffith can't end this, and with Laurel back on the way here, along with Sue, who everybody split oh. up. Oh my god, he got it. the very last auto from beyond wow. the grave, ended up securing the kill onto Psionic. Laurel, however, Looks like he was able to get out. Type 5, maybe not so lucky. Bree gets slowed up and everything is a clencher here. My god. I mean, this is just constant fight after fight. Everybody scurrying to try and get those opening kills. It's funny because Quad recognizes that they need to stop the ramp from uh, Hexa. And so they want to get kills early. But Hexa, they know that. And so they want to stop uh, Quad from getting kills early, which means they want to get kills early. So it's just going to be clash after clash after clash as this goes on. And nobody is letting up. Bree is still taking so much space. Even though the health gaps are not that large, they're still both pretty low. QLDP and Makel, despite the apparent gap that they formed for themselves right now, I have no doubt that they're going to still try and command this bot lane as well. And Scimitar, he's, he's vibing. He's chilling. 
No, I mean, there's no way to contest this, really. I'm Right now, Laurel can't step up to the wave. There's a gale force against this Jinx and a Nautilus that could just pop out of Fog of War. Both supports, I really like their roaming up towards this mid lane to give a little bit of pressure, but the reality is that this mid lane has impacted absolutely nothing so far. Rune Scimitar and Sue, who have been largely on an island with Suhu making the occasional roam down. And while this LeBlanc is certainly impacting the map, Scimitar is getting a lot of farm as well. And remember, he's the secondary win condition for Quad. Should they lose their Aphelios, it's the powerhouse of the victor that'll keep them going. Psyonix's rotation is going to draw out Mako and QLDP, make them back up a little more towards bot lane. This is going to be a slow, coercive commanding of this Earth Drake or Mountain Drake to make sure that stays one and one. The soul path is still going to be far out for them. They haven't completely acted on it yet and might be too late as Griffith and Runer making their way down here. This might be a sandwich onto what's left of Hexa. Breeze gotta keep Type 5 involved right now because level 6 on the Shen will disrupt this fight. It can turn into a 5v4 very, very quickly. There's no teleport for I'm Breeze. There's a big flank going on. A split call from Team Quad puts them in between four members. However, with Han going low, he ends up being the first to get taken down. Jinx taken down as well before she can get excited. And here come the Victor and Aphelios combo that we talked about. Two absolutely massive, destructive carries from the back line ruin the fight for Hexa. And Type 5 was just a smidge too late to do the remainder of the damage. Plus, Mikael got that opening pick off and was able to join the rest of the fight a little early as well. Inferno's gonna blaze and Quad is up to two dragons. Oh my god, that's true. I'd totally forgotten about the Infernal Soul, but it's even scarier than the previous two. Yep. More damage on the rip? More damage than right? Why not at this point? Why not stack on even more to make fights even quicker than that? You haven't seen anything yet as these abilities are going to get stronger and stronger and these champions are going to get more and more confident. Because the, the saddening thing for Team Quad is that QLDP has finally gone down not once, but twice. No longer the carry that he once was. Ripped Herald popped in the mid lane, but QLDP, he simply doesn't care. He's running forward. He's getting an incredible CC chain onto Psionic, who simply does not get to play League of Legends today. The Island Boys, they know what they want, and they're going to grab it. They know that Shelly can only take two or so grabs of this turret out and they rather go for bro go for the kills and go for absolute control cages up on han down to health down to half laurel has to back out and suhu don't even ask dimitar makel three are still moving in still doing massive damage to han but the blast cone can get them out and make them able to reconvene here recoup reassess themselves able to take this fight back out and qldp has to move out asap and of if course, he wants Mikkel's... to have a prayer of moving out okay as well. Of course, Mikkel still got red white, right? He shows up <laughs> and he and he's already cycled through all the other guns. He's already done his autos and he's like, all right, I see that my teammates are low, but if you walk into them, you will die. There is no two ways about it. Goes back, bot lane, collects a little bit more farm. Now the first member on the rip to have crested, crested the 100 CS mark and he is looking good while doing it. Sephelios win condition, looking mighty good for Quad, and I'm sort of kicking myself for earlier. Remember, these guys were the underdogs going into today, but they don't look like it now. Yeah, substitutions aside, they are they are definitely in control of this fight right now. Suhu was trying to engage to take care of Bree, but the bulk is just too much right now. They have to back out just as quickly down to a sliver of health as well, and Scimitar taking a lot of control in mid lane at this point. I mean... Quad, they, they are looking so commanding at this point. Make Hell's now up in top. Oh, this is amazing. 15 HP left on the Blanc, by the way. 15 Jeez. HP on Suhu. Type 5, maybe going a little bit lower. Uh -oh. Needs the Moonlight Vigil under the tower. Straight up ult from QLDP and the hook as well. Makel Gale forces forward to get this kill. And oh. though it takes a long time, it is absolutely worth it. An additional 300 gold going into the pockets of Makel, who's already got 6,000 gold over the course of this game. And it's going to crack open the top lane tower for even more. That V may be Roman, but right now this fight is all Greek to type five. He just hasn't gotten his bearings straight, not able to contend a fight before somebody else can jump in and take it for them. They haven't found the right step to ladder themselves up and, and be able to play catch up here. They need to do that soon. Maybe a, 
a different roam is in order, switching things up with someone like Laurel, who can maybe contest the damage onto the Gragas a little more consistently. But that no. might be too late as the T1 has been taken up, and Mikkel is back on top. We're diving Gragas again. This time, however, we've got a little bit more backup to make it work. Psionics gets out from underneath the tower, and it should be a response for the turrets in this bot lane. Sue, who's going to be able to push up? The problem is we've got some action going on in the mid lane with the tower already destroyed. It's going to be Quad looking for their second in this mid lane, and it will be the crash out of the tower. It will be the tier two falling, and this game is very rapidly getting out of hand for Hexa, who have oh, fallen behind almost 5,000 gold and lose another Rift Herald's charge. And they got the other charge onto the T3. That is just so much massive intimidation for all of Quad. They packed themselves in so heavily, realized, okay, maybe we lose one resource, but we can gain so much more out of the pathing that we're taking right now. And it pays off with dividends. It forces the back out from what Presence was on, uh, on the bot lane as well, just because they know that now Hexa has to reallocate everything to make sure they don't lose too much. That'll cut their entire base in half. Perfectly orchestrated, and now we're starting from scratch again. That Inferno, uh, that that Inferno Drake is on the way. Twenty seconds out. You and I chatted a little bit before the game about the wind conditions, about the way that Quad wanted to play things out, largely avoiding fights, lest they were around objectives. Already, they've certainly found themselves enough fights that they don't need to worry about the objectives anymore, but this is still where they're most comfortable. This is their home territory. And up around this dragon spawn, it's already the engaged going through. QLDP gets an excellent ultimate onto Laurel. Shen ult comes in, the stand united brings everyone together, but it may have brought them together to die. Makel already picking up the first kill and Dragon be darned, we're going for the base. And Sue, who's late to the party here, they were considering going for that Dragon, but then realized that the fight was too contentious to ignore, but they Ooh. may have ignored it for just too long. Scimitar, another kill. Type 5 is backed out by Griffith, taken down as well. That's going to be mid turret, that's going to be mid in him, and that is going to be a lot of presence from the Island Boys. Oh, Laurel ended up going down at the end. Suhu is trying desperately to keep this team together, go, uh, together though still flanking on the blog, still finding the only pick, the only kill that Hexa got in the course of those events. However, now Quad do get to turn back onto yeah. this Infernal Dragon and Suhu popping off in team fights is not going to be enough because if he can kill the Nautilus, that's fine, but you've got to kill this Aphelios. So much damage at this point, and even more now that you have that third dragon up. The soul is already on its way. Hexa, they've had no answers to a lot of this so far, and it's starting to show more and more every single time a fight happens. And Quad, they are picking these fights every single time they see a body. Han's getting spotted already just now, but I don't think QLDP or Griffith are going to really engage. They're going to save all their chips for when this Baron comes up in 90 seconds hoping that they'll be able to secure that one. Well, Hexa wildly hope that they'll be able to steal this one away. They do have the Viego with the Heartbreaker that can reset in these fights if he gets going. He's gone the Divine Sunderer route, the slightly tankier one that gives him a little bit more opportunity to pop off in the fights. But again, so much of their focus has to be around sh around shutting down Makel, and they are the team with not a whole lot of access to that backline. Something else that we talked about in draft, returning to this idea of the Gragas of the Nautilus that can start fights, that can find that back line with the disruption for Team Quad. Hexa don't really have that. It's got to come down to Han with an excellent play, perhaps even flash to back it up. Type 5 invading into the back line alongside Psionix or Suhu, and that's all leaving Laurel undefended. So you've got to pick your poison right now. I I'm picking shutting down Makel if I can. Well, how cool is this quad? Thanks to just glimpses that they give Hexa have sort of corralled the blue side into these tight little corners. They pack themselves in a little too tightly. Save for, of course, Type 5, who's back up in that top lane, back to old island shenanigans in that type site. Griffith is going to bait out a lot of chains here, but it might Infernable, be Infernible, handle, but, Infernible! Oh, Mako, so much damage coming up from the back side. They just cannot engage properly from a distance such as this one. Again, taking a fight that you just can't win right now that was an incredible moonlight visual to bring makel's explosive power to a very very quick reckoning for team hexa another big shutdown for them as the fight continues in this top side and type 5 may get a solo kill they're close to it but Bree can hop out just fine with the flash and may actually try to 
get back to their teammates as they're gonna go for bot three and I mean, the rest of Hexa is a little busy to deal with that too. This is so much space overtaken. They won't completely take the inhib. They know when they're not wanted. They know when they can't win a fight and they are determined to win every single fight that they can actually take. Notice that in between these as well, Makel is constantly cycling guns, constantly mm -hmm. using abilities to try and get rid of ammunition so that he can get back to that red-white the very next time. Griffith maybe a little bit caught out here. Shanes will connect. This could be a very big pick for Team Hexa, and it will be as he's completely isolated on the wrong end of the jungle. Baron available as well. If you finish this pick off, maybe you go for that miracle play. Oh, yeah. Too many, too many people around Griffith at that point. He was a little too alone for a little too long. Able to take advantage of it. That 5v4 for the next 30 seconds could be massive for this Baron fight, which Hex is aware of. They're going to try and take this out. Like you talked about, though, that numbers advantage really, really big right now. Bree does stop them, and Scuttle Crab is doing a lot of work, even with a small amount of vision provided, to keep Quad in the know. It's just enough to make sure that this Baron isn't going to go down, because Griffith, he's up in three seconds. He's going to be ready to fight. Bree gets away. QLDP engaged on Hook, not going to connect, at least initially, but does end up getting the big knockup and the big kills first as Han goes down, and once again, Makel with red and white is unleashed, flashing into Laurel at this point. Aphelios fears absolutely Absolutely nothing, and a heal to speed him up only further demonstrates it. Last auto, not quite going to connect, but he's won the spiritual battle at this point, and he may very well have won the game for his team. Makel and company are going to get to walk their way into the Nexus and start whittling away at these towers. Quad set him up, and even at a deficit, they are knocking them down again. Makel just couldn't be properly contested from this backline, and Hexa, they took too much time in that Baron contest. They had the space, they had the bulk available, but then that mid-presence that could be held by Scimitar along with with the super minions, it was just too much presence for Hexa to want to engage and they took too long, they backed out and then they died for their troubles along with it. Quad, they're able to take enough presence up in the Nexus beyond that and they're able to take game number one in a much more commanding fashion than we thought. Where, where are the subs for my team like that? I, I know, these guys really popped off. It was terrifying to watch. And let's remember, Makel wasn't even a sub. Makel was on this team originally, and he's absolutely destroying. I look at the performance from Team Quad, and it was all around amazing. QLDP providing a lot of setup, but... You need an AD carry that's able to knock that down, that's able to follow up, and that is on the same page. That was Makel all game long, and I am still kicking myself for even suggesting these guys were underdogs because they look so practiced. And I just it's just so insane. Tehexa was aware of this too. They banned the Caitlyn. They banned the Zeri. They picked the Jinx. But you can run from it. The Aphelios is imminent. Yeah, you, you, you cannot hide from Makel, from Team Quad. So Hexa, in this case, have got to turn and fight. We've already seen a composition built around this front to back with a little bit of backline access, but I'd like to see them go all the way in. Either commit to the front to back with a little bit more tankiness, or if you want to have some real fun, let's try and get some assassins out here because Makel needs to die. No two ways about it. And Hexa have got to engineer some crazy way of doing it. They, they've definitely got to figure something out, and they've got to do it fast. Only one game separates Quad from Hexa and the finals. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back for that game, too.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the very first Fractal League of Legends tournament. We are in our second day right now, and Tenrec, furthermore, we are in our second game, because the first one went by like that. It was so quick, and honestly, it's thanks to a lot of really clean play from Quad. Now, what will Hexa do to come back? So they've, they've got to find the right counters to all that damage that can come out from the back line of Quad. Makel was a monster on that Aphelios, regardless of what Hexa could do. They've got to get their positioning right so they can counter whatever sort of approach that Quad takes. And they are going to continue to approach quite a bit to be able to finish this game off even quicker than they did the last one. Look, they want to get out of here early. They want to get back to practicing for the finals match that they have no doubt that they'll take at this point. Yeah, these guys maybe get a little bit confident, though. And let's not forget, Hexa has put a lot of work into making their performance here the best one that it can possibly be. We talked about their extra practice hours that they organized outside of this. And I know for a fact they've got a lot of strong voices on the team that it will be rife with ideas of how they can shut down Makels and a lot of people who are feeling up to the task. My curiosity is who they give that responsibility. As we move in towards game two, as the draft is only seconds away from starting up, up. those picks that can access the back line cleanly are something we've got to look out for because suhu got one just last game on this leblanc and he looked good but the rest of the team needs to come together in this one mission to assassinate Nagel to keep him from playing the game they've got to mesh well they've got to have that right chemistry and, and you got to remember these teams a lot of them before this tournament didn't really know each other that well they probably had just met not really any practice before as a team as a unit but the second that this sort of season started up when they knew that you know we were on a roll and we were about to get these games started everybody they were getting their discord groups together they were in calls practicing watching the vods of yesterday's tournament as well i think some are still in calls right now practicing and watching to make sure that they know everything they need to going into this i mean they are really giving their all into this and i can understand why they're playing for some pretty cool prizes yeah, it is incredible what you get if you end up winning this. If you win today and you make it through the grand finals, uh, you get yourself a bunch of soul to take home with you as well. It's a truckload of Riot merch, an extra Fractal NFT, and even more. Speaking of Fractal, speaking of the team names, if you guys are curious about what on earth is going on here, I'd recommend that you join our Discord and find out. Fractal, of course, a community for games, specifically in Web3, but expanding across so much more as you can see on your screens right now these guys are building one of the largest gaming communities out there and you want to be part of it you want to get on the ground floor go ahead and check out our discord that will be linked in chat that you can find to join the community at fractal and as we say that let's get into the draft right above us team quad team hexa having swapped sides are already deep into this draft and victor importantly has been removed yeah nothing else has really differed when it comes to the ban phase these were all champions that were banned before but clearly uh hexa has recognized scimitar is too much of a problem in that mid lane that presence on the victor was really commanding when we weren't talking about makel and so i can totally understand the victor ban that's going to be you know, one less champion that you can use to corral uh, your, your enemies out. And there's still one more space to still get rid of that Zeri. Thank God there is, because Zeri in the hands of Makel would have been something that I don't think any of us Ooh, yeah, were prepared absolutely. for. However, we do have that Jinx available, Aphelios as well, and Hexa are in the unfortunate position of only being able to take away one of them, and I really don't think you want to give the other over. So we'll see how creative they get with those first two picks. Xin Zhao already picked up for Team Quad and a very high value pick for them last game. I love this pick for Quad, not just because Griffith did such an incredible job on the Xin Zhao. It's asking Hexa to blind pick outside of it, saying, hey, look, we'll wait for you. We can, we can work with whatever. Just let our jungler be. And that's what Hexa did last time. That's what they're going to do this time. They're forced to pick the Aphelios first. They don't want it in the hands of Makel, but that might just mean we might have a jinx from Makel. Yeah, it's, it's a tough thing to decide, right? And I like that Hexa identify, at the very least, that they know the Aphelios is good. They're not sure about the Jinx. They say, all right, well, we'll remove <laughs> the thing that we know. And they get a great combination for it as well. The Thresh lock-in providing a lot of value. We talked about the denial of the Aphelios Thresh combination just last game. This time, going to be picked up by Hexa. So a nice move from them. But like you mentioned, Jinx is the natural conclusion on Team Quad. Yeah, Quad is going to run that Jinx. There's not too much chemistry that you can find from it so far, but don't worry. Quad is going to put those pieces together by the time that this draft is done. You can get a lot of information from Hex's drafts 
uh, or bands after these first three drafts, I'm sure that a couple other things will change. There's clearly a lot of notes that Hexa has to have taken, regardless of how little time there was to play in that first game. They have a lot that they could have learned from that, and we've already seen they fan the victor, they pick the Aphelios first, they're trying to adapt, and Quad, they have to be prepped for it. I do genuinely wonder if this is going to be the time for them to ban something like a Nautilus and wow, Team Quad don't even take the risk. Is. I was thinking back on last game and just how good QLDP was in the bot lane. Seeing that Nautilus come out again, it's got to be very scary for Team Hexa, but they can't forget that they need backline access over everything. Well, maybe a little bit of a gauge as well. Yeah, I think those are the last two slots that need to be filled mm -hmm. in, but I'm glad that QLDP picked up the Nautilus. Great get in, cool, great get out tool to make sure that bot lane is going to be super heavily contested, despite the fact that there is a thresh on the other side of uh, of that river. Orin is going to get picked up by Hexa as well. There's your top laner a lot earlier into the draft than I think we saw uh, in the draft last game for either team. I'm interested why it's a blind pick for Orin on top. I, I think that the idea here is to give them a little bit more wiggle room in the mid lane. You've got R5, R5 available. You don't want to reveal the jungler just yet because you can still go assassin there. But by picking up an Orn, you get yourself that all important front line into the Jinx, this hyper scaling tank, and you get, and I'm going to put it in quotes, backline access. You have engage, <laughs> you have frontline, and you have, again in quotes, backline access. And, and the reason I say that, that is somewhere. because. It's because it's they call the Forge God, right? Immobile carries like Jinx have a very difficult time dodging it. You get that knock up. It makes everyone else's job so much easier. I'm hoping for an assassin jungle, but I am absolutely requiring a counter pick in mid lane. Hex has gotten rid of the Rise, and Quad has banned the Hecarim. Hex are countering with the Orianna, so they're definitely, they're definitely gunning for that at this point, I would say, Dia. No, th th this is a absolute focus for them. These two control mages going to be things that can keep you at arm's length and still scale very well. Hexa don't want to deal with that. I wouldn't be surprised if they went with something like a LeBlanc again, but we could get a little bit more specific. Things like Akali are available that we haven't seen her in the mid lane in a very long time. She can make Jinx's life extremely difficult. Team Quad are going to have the option to counter whatever this is, though, so I'm expecting it to be a jungler. Team Hexa likely picking themselves something stable here, perhaps bringing a little bit of damage to the table, but you don't want to go too far out of the box right right now. I think Hexa needs to be comfortable with picking their jungler now. I mean, Quad clearly recognizes that jungling was a threat, and they don't want the Viego to really find any sort of wiggle room. So they're gonna swap. They're gonna opt for the Diana instead, mm -hmm. which I think is a perfectly serviceable option. Absolutely, Diana can carry a lot of that jungle pathing early on. Just get around everywhere she needs to, and then carry on into the fight. Deal so much territorial damage along the way. One of the best parts of Diana as well is that she opens you up for an AD mid laner. Again, very rare to see. I don't expect it, but if they wanted to go that route, Team Hexa now have the option to still have a really nice damage portfolio with the AP that Diana will bring scaling as well as being able to pick themselves up an assassin in that mid lane that does go the more AD route. Shen on the other side, a natural pivot from Team Quad, recognizing the dive that Diana has brought the backline access Orin already has to try and help Jinx, help Makel weather this storm. Shen, like we said, natural pick here, but now they've got to blind a mid laner. What do you go with? Don't want to give my two cents anymore because, I mean, Quad has picked the Syndra, but I think she can open up the board really nicely for the Xin Zhao and the Nautilus to roam back and forth. I think she can kind of stop play whenever she really needs to and, you know, take what she needs and then back right up so then Quad can prepare for the actual fight. I think Syndra is a solid option for that. Singes a really good pick as well into the Aphelios. We've got this composition that is built entirely, yes, around nice. him. But as nice. I say it, nice. the composition pivots. It's turned from being all about Aphelios to being all about the classic combination, the knock-up, the damage, the AD mid laner that we called out earlier. It isn't an assassin, but it'll do nicely. <laughs> It'll definitely do what it needs to do. I'm wondering what sort of utility Aphelios will bring to the table from this point on. Maybe it just means that they can service the backline a little bit more. Uh, maybe that'll help out with the access along with Orn as well, just breaking through whatever line you have with the Thresh and Yasuo upon the entrance. But it means Hexa can be a little more volatile in those mid-fights. That's going to be the scariest th uh, thing for them going into this, I think. 
It, it, re it really is. And I, one of the things that I am worried about for Hexa as well is as much as I like their comp composition, they don't have a whole lot of early pressure. A lot of their ability to fight relies on hitting level six and ideally having one, maybe even two items picked up. And with that time, Team Quad can do a lot. We saw the Dragons play an instrumental role just last game for Team Quad, and they should have access to them again with plenty of wave clear in the mid lane. Plenty of pressure coming from the Jinx Nautilus in the bot lane and the early power of the Zin Zhao, especially when compared to the Diana. With Viego, it's a little more even. Viego will lose, but it's slow. Diana will lose that 1v1 very, very quickly. And it means that Team Hexa are kind of kept out of the game. And they're taking this bet. They're saying, I don't think Team Quad can finish the game before 25 minutes. And if they're right, they win. And if they're wrong, they're out. Hexa, they of trouble contesting objectives in the first game and it's not like they're going to stop having trouble now what matters is that they can hold the game up by the skin of their teeth until they can make things work it's going to be an uphill battle at some point but hexa they're willing to run uphill I, I like it, too, because they've got multiple win conditions. If Psyonix gets fed, it's amazing. If Suhu gets fed, it's amazing. And if Laurel gets fed, it's amazing. Type 5 and Han... Maybe not so much, but you've got three solid <laughs> options, right? And that's going to be enough. Laurel, of course, a really big center point for the team. But I am really looking forward to the combination of this Yasuo, Diana, Psionic, and Suhu need to be on the same page at all times. Their synergy has to be on point. And if it is, they're going to be able to tie up this series. On the other side, of course, we are looking at Makel once more. This Syndra looks good. It can be powerful, I'm sure, but its job is to hold down the fort in mid lane so Makel can pop off. It is Makel, Makel, Makel all day. It's going to be the same job that the Victor was trying to pull off. Just make sure that the mid lane is not going to be a battleground or a graveyard for anybody in quad. Syndra can do that job nicely while Makel is going to go for that Jinx ramp, but she needs some space to do it. Will quad provide it or will Hexa shut it down? We'll be able to find out in just a couple minutes when game two starts up. I'm very excited to do it. We're going to go to a short break right now as we prepare for this second game. And as we do, it is my great privilege to remind you that casting for this event is provided by Beyond Ranked, a platform where you, yes, you, can book commentators for anything. Whether it's a tournament, a league, a show match between friends, you can find someone, someone like us, perhaps, to amp up your gameplay. If you're a tournament or a league organizer, you can use Beyond Ranked to manage your entire broadcast team by finding new talent, adding them to your team, and even assigning them to specific broadcasts. No longer do you have to use spreadsheets and doodle polls. Now you can just use Beyond Ranked. Check out beyondranked.com or hop in their Discord today. We'll see you guys on the Rift.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Rift once more as Team Quad takes on Team Hexa once again with Team Quad up a game. And already some very early plays being made by both sides. Unfortunately, Tenrek, they're on opposite sides of the Rift. These teams, they're loving to go for the invasions, but they're doing it simultaneously. So nobody finds any connection out of it. No matter. That just means that everybody can head to their posts a little behind schedule but nothing will be that missed it's funny they're taking different strats for it everybody on hexa Ooh. is just still moving as a unit Check towards mid and they actually might meet makel griff and qldp here oh my god oh they're waiting no way. It. there it is qldp finally sees it and flashes away four members still in the area so it is risky oh. but the flash from han catches qldp no flash on this nautilus heal expended and the tornado comes out to secure first blood for laurel you couldn't have written a better start to this game unlucky clip there for qldp to hook away didn't get enough space out of it still had a little bit of bullet to carry him through but sadly, there was just too much damage from that close quarters to be able to get through. That's the exact kind of start that Hexa doesn't necessarily love to ride on, but at least loves to see for a morale boost. Yeah, and at, at this point, you can sit back a little bit. Resets have not come in just yet. So this advantage hasn't actually hit the table. The most tangible of ways that it has is the flashes on these supports. And uh, what I thought was a heal that came in, but now that I'm looking at the at the scoreboard, I'm not actually seeing one. So my eyes may have deceived me. A little bit of shield level up for Nautilus instead. So a subpar level one ability, as well as the summoners. These things, these things, they happen. We make mistakes. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't level up our shield. These things, they happen. QLDP getting hooked away again. Nice. It there happens. we go. Again, there we go. Find Thor. Find Thor. Ignite. Ignite. Not gonna, oh, do it. Not gonna do it. One no, more auto really. for Makel would have absolutely killed Laurel there. Yeah, but the flash is gone again, so a lot of Griffith. resources are already getting expended, and Griffith recognizes that. They're gonna try and move in on this turn immediately. There goes Laurel, and Han is soon to follow right after. And just like that, Quad has taken up the bigger number, but not for long as the turret will be able to finish off Griffith, and Psyonix is on the way back to try and take advantage of what little health Makel and QLDB have left. This is already so much fun to watch in this bot lane. Yeah, I mean, is this a double kill at level two underneath the enemy tower? It can only be Team Quad that pulls something like that off. Their focus on Makel is absolutely unwavering, and Griffith's pathing speaks to that, being ready for the bot lane dive. Something that not all junglers would do. You can tell in his pathing that he took the, the fast lane there, only clearing out really the red buff before heading down and pays off in a big way evening up that bot side getting himself two kills as well griffith was the main beneficiary of that and is now going to be able to spread that advantage around the map and quad you can tell they're they're trying to find every semblance of room they can to make sure that hexa they don't uh they, they don't find the snowball that quickly brie is so fearless going up against type 5 and is getting an easier level up for it better cs at the moment and i mean scimitar is Again, just still vibing in mid lane, doing all that they need to do at the moment to, to keep the rest of the team in a stable position. Ooh. But Griffith is roaming around and getting cut out by Psyonix right now. That means that Scimitar is going to have to engage. Suhu left alone right now after Psyonix has to back out. But the damage is already done. There's one kill. Suhu going to try and find another. This Yasuo is so awesome to watch. Yeah, really good stuff from Suhu. This is exactly what you need as Hexa as well to get this guy rolling. You get kills spread across all three members of the bot side, mid, 80, carry, and support. So at least this side of the map, very strong for you. And in a way that really Hexa had no way to expect. Their bot side should have been weak, and we're going to see how strong it is now. Hooks returned on both 80 carries. However, Han's going a little bit lower at the time, and we've run out of red, white for Laurel. Han going to go down. Getting excited is Makel Zap. Not off cooldown just yet. And Laurel's going to be able to retreat into the minions, but he does it alone. I mean, that's a lot of damage picked up along the way against Laurel, too. Makel found enough from the get excited to really put some fear into Laurel, cause a near full reset here, and the weapon rotation isn't optimal either. Makel knows that, recognizes it, Griffith. and sees an opportunity to get even more out of this, and Griffith is rotating in. Gonna charge in, get some more damage on Alora before Han is able oh. to get him out of jail there. And oh, QLDP and Griffith there now on the run this time. This is such a cool back and forth. 
Rune did have Flash in that mid lane, so not too concerned about his own life. However, he's waiting till that level 6, wants to get the spike before resetting, wants to try and put himself in a place where he can, at the very least, burst a chunk out of Suhu. But it's going to be a tall order because take a look at the CS right now. 27 to 43 in this mid lane. In a melee versus ranged matchup, Rune Scimitar <laughs> is doing unspeakable things, and I don't know how he's getting away with it. Yeah, he, I mean, he's been able to move around a lot more than I think we bargained for even during the draft. We assumed they were going to play distance and keep the presence so everybody could really do what they want to do, but Scimitar has had a lot more freedom than I think Hexa has let them, uh, or, or has intended to let them have. That being said, they found their advantages in other quadrants of the map and they've been able to keep pace to to most extents here type 5 has taken a lot of this ground back on the top lane for the moment keeping a solid presence very close to level 6 as well this dragon that's first is up and psionics is in closer proximity to it than anyone else but could get sandwiched before anybody else can make it back in time regardless everything is still pretty heavily contested by either side it is really anyone's game right now it really is we'd expected quad our island boys to have first dibs on this dragon but psionics doing his absolute best to make sure that doesn't come to fruition clearing out the vision may have solo access to this dragon and griffith not even in this area of the jungle is playing a little bit more conservatively on the zins out perhaps waiting for the one item spikes themselves with quad Taking a small step back early on. There's a gold advantage available for Hexa. They can make it howl happen right now with a nice fight. Level sixes are hit. Knockup should be available very soon. Suhu still has the tornado. Throws it out towards Makel, but doesn't find him. Instead, Ignite's gone down, and Makel's still very much alive. Is duking it out as Type 5 and Rune Scimitar do the exact same thing. And Rune Scimitar may actually go down. Two more autos would do it. We tune back down into the bot lane. Makel still very much alive, and I don't believe any kills on either side. Side, but the dragon went over to quad after all of that wow yeah quad that was a great preemptive convergence there on top of the dragon knowing that everybody else was going to move in griffith was on the way as well as suhu kind of alone in the mid site at the moment and of course i mean uh griff i mean uh excuse me sorry um where we going? Uh, Laurel was on the way as well uh, as Han, so it could have been an easy 4v4, but Quad, they were ready for it at that time. They were ready to jump on the river, and they'd already done enough damage before Griffith made it back in time for everybody to be able to engage. So they were able to take that dragon, then take the fight, last long enough for them to redisperse and not lose anybody along the way. Quad's got to be very happy with that trade-off. I, it's really impressive that they were able to pull it off and only speaks to the experience, to the competitive nature of this roster, to the preparation that they have put into today. We know Hex has been doing a lot too, though, and to see this kind of early advantage for them, even if they didn't get the dragon, is already a win in their books. Because remember, they want to make it to the 25-minute mark, and then they want to start popping off. Hex have so much scaling, so much damage potential, so much wombo combo on their team that a team fight where nobody dies even over this first dragon is a win yeah if they stall for as long as they did against that first dragon then they've got to be satisfied with how this game is going to end up going we're eight minutes 43 in and the second dragon isn't going to be around until after the 10 minute mark that is really really massive after the 11 minute mark actually but actually no it's gonna be after the 12th oh that's massive that's really massive for the uh, my caster map time. doesn't support for this i, I can't well. do it it's three, yeah, nine. Oh, just around the 12. Okay, and Griffith is going to grab that Herald as well. They're setting up the dominoes, and it's slow, but it is sure. I, I am really impressed by the fact that Griffith does have the confidence to go for that Rift Herald. It is natural, you would think, looking at the Sin Southfolk, mm -hmm. looking at the way these compositions should play out on paper. But given the state of the game, it isn't a given that he would be able to secure that. With Bree playing conservatively in the top side, you can tell he and Griffith are communicating. Griffith having other priorities right now. Can't stick around top for too long, but does come to check in, make sure that his top laner isn't being dove and ends up finding Psionics in the meantime. Going over the wall, they've got a... 1v2 type oh. 5, but oh lord, not even getting there in time as the Brittle does Shen in and leaves Griffith topside with a Rift Herald, but not much else. Good catch. That's a great ghost signal for Psionics and Type 5, along with Suhu. Hello there. How you doing, man? To uh, take as much space as they can in this top lane. It's funny. 
Hexa is going to be per playing perpetually at a disadvantage for so much of this game, and yet they still exhume so much confidence and get away with it because Quad's not expecting it. Griffith gets converged on. He doesn't expect three members of Hexa to walk up this far, take this much space, and do this much damage, but that's exactly what they do. That's exactly what they accomplish. It's this audacity from Hexa that I, I don't work. think that he was ready for, right? Like, Gr Griffith goes, well, of course you won't be here. Laurel in the same way goes, well, of course you won't engage on me here. And he has to <laughs> blow a summoner for it. You look back oh, at Goblin no. and Bring goes, of course they don't gank me again. But the thing is that they do. But Psionic following a little bit, him a little bit too far underneath the tower. Does have to retreat. Ends Sue up who's coming this back, wave, And Sue who is ready. They want this again. kill. No knockup available this time, but it should still be a kill. Bree flashing away. Sue who taking up the tower. This Shen, very nicely played. Wow, yeah, great rotation back and forth, fading out Ooh. any and every attack and still surviving it all. And, you know, why not get a kill from Makel in mid lane while you're at it? This presence on mid, all of a sudden, due to the confidence that Hexa had in trying to take down this Shen, has actually led to a big opening on this T1 in mid. That rocket was thick with at least three Cs. That was delicious to watch <laughs> and feeding these plays into Makel. Hey. Gonna do really big things, especially the extra 300 gold that went over to Griffith, especially with the first tower already secured by Makel down in this bot side, but it does set them at a slight tempo disadvantage as Hexa have already reset and want to take down some plates in this mid lane. There might be a team fight, a Bruin, and Quad aren't ready for it item-wise. They need to go back to base, and it might mean that they need to give up this dragon. Yeah, Quad needs a second, and they might have to trade this out. I agree with you, giving the Ocean Dragon away for the sake of holding out until the point where they're a little more ready to fight things out. But again, Hexa, they're totally okay with that. That means they can wait this Dragon out, take it down, get the buff, and then make the Soul wait even longer. That's even more time spare. That's even more time for Hexa to set up even more of what they need. They're already on their way to a really solid deficit up against Quad. Mythics are starting to get hit, though. Gore Drinker picked up for Griffith, giving him a lot more survivability in that front line. Gale Force, a natural repositioning element for Makel, allowing him to both offensively get excited when he needs to and defensively back away from Suhu and Psionic when they get too close. Lockdown is going to be essential when we're thinking about Makel, and we are going to be thinking about Makel, so watch out. Whoo, Lord, Flash already blown from Psionic. Suhu thinking about the re-engage. A nice ward comes down to spot out that, that Diana Yasuo combo that deadly diana yasuo combo was just around the corner yeah han was there just in time to to stop things separate the kids in the schoolyard fight type 5 and brie though is the fight that i'm watching a lot more just because brie has had to backtrack so often so type 5 has had so much space to level up now a two level gap but makel and qldp they're looking to make a three to one gap and they're looking to do it right now. Ult comes out, but all too late. There's the kill onto the Orn. And this is the moment that Bree has really got to step up and find a whole lot of space. But instead, gonna back up and let QLDP and Makel do the talking in top lane. And this is the Makel funnel that nobody was ready for. He's collected bot lane tower. He's now collected mid lane tower. And Rune Scimitar is getting ganked of all things. Hans tank an extra tower shot. He may end up going down, but the ults do come in and Rune Scimitar is forced back underneath the tower. Psionic going low as Bree's not going to be quite able to finish this one off. Chu end up in bot lane at the very end of all this. Suhu and Bree fighting it out. Psionic clears away the jungle, but we were talking about Makel and we're still talking about Makel because he's cleaned up every single outer tower by the 13 minute mark. Yeah, that was pretty even Stevens trade-wise, but yet Makel still makes the front page of everything we talk about that they happen to walk into simply because of the damage that they are already providing and the knowledge of when to come in and how to strike properly without getting punished. Go. And they're gonna do it yet again. They're still on the run from Type 5, but there is no way that they find him. Infernum ultimate from Laurel does do a little bit of damage in return, but look at that. Nobody from Quad died. Instead, they continue walking forward, and Makel, Makel's on the way. He's found Han on the side, forces out the flash. Laurel, still all alone, gets deleted by Rune Scimitar, and that farm disadvantage in the mid lane, not mattering so much anymore. Not when you can roam around the death squad and pick up four kill participation in such a short amount of time. 
squad's reconvene has worked to a T up to this point. Their ramp has their, their ramp has been on par with where they want it to be, despite all the setbacks that they've met earlier on in the game. Even though they only have that one dragon, they still have a lot of control over where they decide to go. They still have three turrets, which means they still have a lot more gold, and they are still insanely threatening as we approach. 16 minutes now, Hexa, they are running out of time to run out of time. <laughs> they really are, and it's a scary concept to think about. Mako picking up the red buff now, getting prepared for this next Rift Herald. Griffith has already set up and is starting to execute. I think Hexa are very well aware that they cannot fight the objective at this time, but they may just go for it anyway, because we're getting a few pings onto the Rift Herald, and if they do, if this goes wrong, Hexa could be shut out of the game entirely. Silenix goes for it, pops down the ultimate, but doesn't have enough damage to deal with the double team that is I'm Bree and Griffith. Meanwhile, Makel gets out of a 2v2 with a double kill, leaving Suhu all alone at the very end of everything. We'll have that knockup. Doesn't connect onto Makel, though, and if it's not connecting onto Makel, it's not worth a dime because Makel props this team up. I adore how everyone knew exactly how to manage their roles in there. Bree came in a second late, jumped in on the competition. They weren't expecting the double team. And then QLDP could take all the remaining damage from the other side. Every distraction works perfectly there for Quad. And they're going to get a whole lot of connection out of it. A Rift Herald along with another solid back with so much territory taken up. Nickel's 5-0. and oh. He's got... 9,300 gold. The guy's almost at 10,000 gold, and, and when he reaches it, he will be at nearly double the gold of anyone on the enemy team. Hexa are not coming close to touching what is a nearly divine Jinx right now. And that Diana Yasuo combination is starting to slip further and further away. We saw it disjointed at the start of the last Herald fight, but Psionic and Suhu need to be on the same page, and that page needs to be titled, underlined, and highlighted as <laughs> Makel. Psionix has definitely made an impact in the game so far simply by existing. Running in on the fight early on in the game has made it so QLDP and Griffith can't roam around as much as they had pleased. But now comes time to really complete and actually do the damage that you need to as that Diana. And so far, Psionix has just been denied all too often. And with the space that's been taken up by the turret control, I mean, look at the control that Quad has over this River for Dragon already. Before any sort of fight even begins, before the Dragon even made its way onto spawn, before anybody could even really get a grip on where they need to go, Quad's gonna grab this. It does not speak quietly that Psyonix, despite the amazing play this game, has been forced to take Krugs while the dragon is taken. It is not a position that you envy seeing as a jungler. And watching this happen only makes things more difficult for the rest of the team, Suhu in particular, who uses that wind wall defensively and all alone doesn't have a prayer against the army. That is quad right now. 15 to 6, the score line, nearly a 10,000 gold lead as we're approaching it second by second. Rift Herald gets summoned, and it's going to be another crash into the base, potentially even an inhibitor tower taken. Oh yeah, you can tell that Hexa is prepped for fights, but Quad is taking the fights to where Hexa doesn't want to be. And that's leading to catastrophic amounts of damage in the weak points that Hexa sets up for themselves when they try to get a different kind of fight going. Yeah, Bot and Hib's gonna go bye-bye, and I mean, Quad, they don't lose anything for it. No, it is miraculous the way that this has been played out with the inhibitor down free 20 minutes. Something that many would look back at and call perhaps a misstep. A lot of times uh, taking inhibitors before 20 minutes exposes the enemy team to a lot of farm that they would not otherwise get. But in this particular case, in this particular game state where you are almost 10,000 gold up, where Quad have been running around the map willy nilly nonstop, I think what it really does is open up the potential for the Baron because Inhibitor won't be up and nobody on Team Hexa has the ability to deal with the Super Minions. Yeah, this fight on top of the Baron is going to be catastrophic for Hexa if it's not managed absolutely perfectly. They need to make sure that there isn't enough of a farm onto the Nexus turrets and yet at the same time, they need to at least try and hold off on this Baron until they can maybe muster up a better fight. That's what they've been waiting for this whole time, isn't it? It's, it's for Hexa to be able to muster up enough to take a fight more 
more easily, but they haven't been given enough time. Quad's ramp in this mid game has been so dynamic and beautiful to watch. And now as we approach the very same amount of time that it took Quad to win the first game, they are still looking as good as ever. Type 5 is about to be caught out. Psyonix is about to be caught out on a different front, but in the very no same problem. lane. Run Psyonix, he can't be here, not without Yasuo, and Suhu is just starting to leave the base right now. It feels bad, but there's no way to save Type 5 there, and as a result, there's really no way to access this jungle either. Complete vision dominance for Quad. There are, is a mere single ward outside of the turret right now, providing a little bit of information to Hexa, but if you can't step into your own jungle, you certainly cannot step into the Baron Pit, and that is the next step as Quad continue to push up for this tier two ultimate comes down laurel goes and down as the mega death rocket connects a double kill goes over to griffith and in a split second quad tear hex apart just hand the deed over this summoner's rift is officially completely owned by quad all hexa has left is their fountain is their entire base save for one little inhib that is about to respawn quad they have control over everything else the dragon the baron the turrets the minions they have it all and they are about to work with what they've got which is everything i i gotta say that hexa have shown some extraordinary gumption this game but as we said yesterday at this point it will take a miracle for this team that has communicated, that has set up practice, that has executed on some really creative game plans and drafts to actually pull this game out. Suhu, you can tell, desperately wants to come online, needs that second or third item to finally hit his power spike as Yasuo, but he may not have access to it. These super minions are his life's blood, but he needs time more than anything. Quad, they're just as packed as Hexa was. If Hexa took a fight a couple seconds earlier, they might have had a better shot at it, but the entrance is already there. Han is too low level to do too much damage, and Psyonix has already been caught out in the middle of the fight. Q, the, Q all DP is also down the side of the fight as well. So Type 5 can't get enough connection with that oh. ultimate, and it's gonna get slain first for it. Then the Yasuo soon to follow. Everyone else is on the back. Oh, oh, and gets death death rocket by a long <laughs> shot on the Death Rocket, and another <laughs> kill. <laughs> Tail there from Makel. If that's not a great way to finish off something like this, Makel getting the 5k, I don't know what is. It's unbelievable to watch it happen on the stage in front of us, but if anybody was going to do it, Makel was going to do it. Team Quad now ceremoniously get to walk their super minions into the base, get to send themselves into the grand finals for Fractal's very first League of Legends tournament on the back of a 2 to nothing. This is one of the most dominant teams that we've seen, and they are sending themselves forward with the promise that they will continue to dominate. Quad, they took every step, every advantage and they used it to their absolute fullest quad was able to take game two in just about the exact same amount of time that they took game one in somehow an even more commanding fashion it's the island boys heading to the grand finals you do not see a penta every day but man oh man when you see it happen like this it is beautiful and it was orchestrated from so early on massive props to the quads quad squad That's for what? outlasting what was a very difficult early game to play through. Hexa put up a big fight in game two that Quad were somehow able to overcome and turn into, like you said, one of the most convincing games we've seen. Yeah, Hexa, they put up a solid barricade with some great kills early on and a lot of denial for what Quad was looking for to set things up. And yet they found the damage somewhere, they found the gold somewhere, and they won fight after fight after fight after fight. They took the Nexus down with them. Quad is your winners for tonight, and it's only 940. Uh, yeah, it's it's crazy 8, 8, the way that these these, these guys were these guys were able to execute on an inhuman level with a snowball like that. I'm surprised we weren't seeing a Nunu. That was some incredible stuff, and I look forward to seeing them in the grand finals. And I got to tell you, you guys should too, because they are going to be aired right here. If you want to know when and how 
to catch them, I'd certainly recommend joining Fractal's Discord. Fractal, of course, a marketplace for gaming NFTs, durable assets that let you do something inside of a gaming universe. And we've got the biggest community for it right here. Our mission is to create an open platform for the free exchange of digital goods. And we do that by partnering with the best gaming companies, launching NFTs and building tools that can help them reach customers at scale. It is a massive gaming community. We are hosting tournaments like that, like this all the time. And I recommend that you guys join if you want to piece of the action because the prizing in this grand final is something that is through the roof that wows me every time i think about it make sure to check out the other socials for fractal as well follow us on twitter and youtube if you haven't yet for extra updates from the entire community and of course if you haven't hit that magical purple button below the screen right now follow fractals twitch aka justin's twitch i suppose we're going to be, be doing a lot more events like this in the future hopefully with an ever expanding community but the end of this first event will conclude with these grand finals, which will be coming to you very, very soon. But until then, Dia, I think it's time we take a well-deserved rest, as do these teams, as we prep for the biggest match of all. It certainly is. Thank you so much, Tenrec, and to all of the production behind the scenes that made this possible. To you, the audience, for tuning in to watch some of the most beautiful League of Legends that I've had the opportunity to witness in quite some time. And of course, a reminder to be sure to tune into those grand finals. Quad versus Try. Join our Discord, follow our socials to make sure you know when it's happening, because you don't want to miss it.